Hello, everyone. So my name is Arnaud Dors. I'm part of the Open Technology Group at IBM. I'm actually not really a security expert. I'm an open source expert. I actually brag about the fact that I started an open source in 1990 with the release of the LibXPM, which is still in use today, amazingly enough. So, uh, but I have been working with OpenSSF for something like three years, something like this. And uh, I'm actually currently the vice chair of the technical advisory committee, and I'm a maintainer of the Salsa specification, and I kind of try to help around in different groups. So today we wanted to talk about the software supply chain security in general. Um, we, uh, I have some panelists with me that I've invited, that I've been working with in OpenSSF and around for all these years. And the idea was to try to you know, go a little bit beyond the headlines and give you a, a greater picture of what's going on and where we think we are and what the challenges we have we're still facing. So I just have a few slides just to give some kind of background. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of talk. That's not the point of this uh, session. Um, you know, being an open source uh, developer for so many years, for me, it's an amazing success that, uh, you know, open source software is basically used everywhere. So that's the good news for people like me who invested their lifetime, basically, or professional lifetime to open source. This is great news. The downside of this is it's become a primary target for all the bad actors. And so it's kind of like, you know, the, the, what we're getting from the success of open source. It's basically, you know, open source has become the soft target for bad actors. They are attacking open source software because because open source is used everywhere, eventually the vulnerabilities they put into the open source software makes its way into products. And that's what we are seeing more and more. There's actually literally an explosion of those attacks. There are many different vectors, and some of which we will touch on today. But, you know, there's a litany of vulnerabilities of different types. It keeps coming. Every year brings their big news. You have some of the icons there you may recognize of some of the big ones we have had to deal with over the last several years. And unfortunately, you know, they, this will keep on going. But essentially, a few things have happened. First, you know, it's clearly starting to become unsustainable. It's costing a lot of money. And in fact, there is even some public safety issue at, at play because open source is used everywhere and a lot of the software we use, a lot of devices we use, use the software, become vulnerable, and it actually even becomes a public safety issue. And so governments around the world are starting to take notice and say, guys, this just cannot keep on going. And so the industry is trying to be proactive and say, yes, we hear you, we are working on it. The problem is, it's not like many of the other technical challenges we have been facing in the industry over the years, where every industry, every company on its own can try to tackle this issue. This issue is bigger than any single company can tackle. So we've seen a wave of, you know, initiatives around the industry now where companies, organizations are trying to get together, say, okay, what are we doing about this problem? There are literally millions of open source projects, so it's clearly a big task. So we have many different foundations. Some of us are involved in OpenSSF, but there are others. Uh, OWASP is another one. Uh, we have Eclipse Foundation is also having some activities. CNCF is having tech activities. We are seeing some of those pop up everywhere. And it's good because, you know, obviously the problem is big, so there's not enough uh, people working on it yet. At a high level, we can, you know, distinguish different buckets of problems that we are trying to address. Everybody should be familiar by now of S-bombs. There are different standards being developed. This is software bill of materials. It's the first step is, you know, we've come to realize when vulnerabilities came up, we didn't necessarily know where 
it, the software being, uh, you know, um, uh, impacted uh, was used in the products. So the first item was to say, okay, we need more transparency, more understanding at the corporation level. I'm not even talking about externally, about what's being used in our product. And then governments are saying, well, you need to actually inform your customers about what's in them. So there is this aspect, is trying to identify what are the products made of. There is this notion of dependency graph. We have this huge dependency and, you know, now every programming language, modern programming language has some kind of module uh, packaging mechanism where you can do all these imports. And we all go through this where you do this comments like npm install and it just drags in from like the whole internet, a whole bunch of packages. Clearly we have no idea what we are pulling in, but effectively we're trusting that all this code is going to do the right thing. So we actually need to better understand what this graph of dependencies is and get the right tools to be able to browse through this and eventually when you know, there are vulnerabilities being disclosed, we can quickly identify the impact of this. And so there are different tools being developed in this space. I just listed two on the slide. GUAC, we will talk about, I think, is developed in OpenSSF. Dependency track is one developed in OWASP, and there are others. Then there's the integrity uh, protections. This is like, you know, the notion that how do you make sure that the packages you're being delivered or you're, you're using is actually what you think it is or what it claims to be? So there are mechanisms, some of which have been around for a long time, digital signature, you sign your packages. You know, back way back then, when I was working on Apache project, we were developing, I was working on the XML parser exercises, it was common you know, practice to sign the package every time you had a release. There are new technologies like SIGSTOR, which is developed in OpenSSF, which tries to simplify these operations because they often depend on keys, which are a pain to maintain and a pain to try to verify. And so there are tools now being developed to try to simplify all these operations. And then there is this notion of, you know, process-based measurements. It's like, well, we all know that there's like a whole pipeline that you actually use, the CI CD pipeline, DevSecOps, the kind of things where you're like, you go through a whole process to generate your artifacts. And how can you make sure that you can actually trust all the different elements that come into play into this process? And so there are different uh, tools and specifications being developed to try to define how you can communicate you know, attestations about what happened, where it happened, who made the build, and, uh, you know, using what environment and so on. And at the same time, be able to, to, to consume that information on the other end. And there's also best practices. A lot of this actually comes down to educating developers to do the right thing and, you know, not just blindly trusting uh, packages that come, you know, from the internet. And so there's a whole bunch of guides also that are being developed in that space. And then at the end, you know, there's a consumption aspect. And I don't know if you were at the keynotes, uh, Ryan uh, actually talked about this S2C2F. And it's, you know, it's kind of the end of that spectrum where, you know, my analogy is always like, you know, in the car industry, we are, I mean, uh, auto manufacturers are required to produce cars with seat belts. But at the end of the day, if people don't put them on, it doesn't do any good, right? So we also need to help people do the right thing so they can, no matter how much we actually put into producing those artifacts and making them secure, getting them signed on and not so on, if they don't actually go through the step of verifying that all of this is actually good, it's the right thing coming from the right spot and so on, it doesn't do any good. So there are different technologies and guides being developed in that space to try to help people manage their open source dependencies. And more generally speaking, 
the software dependencies because again, you know, it's not just people who use open source, it's people who use products that are built with open source. So that's kind of what, you know, I wanted to touch on. This is basically the background we are underneath, where we are working with. And we will now go through the panel. I will invite them to introduce themselves first. Just a plug, if you're interested, if you haven't seen it, there's an event after the conference on Thursday happening here, which is organized by OpenSSF. There's a SOS Community Day that you're invited to participate in. If you're interested, it's actually free to attend, but you do need to register. So, let's uh, have an introduction. Mike, let's sure. start. Um, hi, I'm Mike Lieberman. Uh, my background is mostly in the end user space for most of my career, but over the past several years, I've done a lot of work in um, open source space, uh, starting in sort of the CNCF. Uh, where I was an end user, but then um, joining uh, Tag Security, where I'm a, a lead, um, and then uh, doing a lot of work within OpenSSF as uh, both a TAC member, Technical Advisory Council member, as well as Governing Board member, and a maintainer of various uh, open source projects, uh, some of which are in OpenSSF, like Salsa and Guac, and I'm also the co-founder of Kusari, a software supply chain security company. Hey, uh, I'm um, I'm Tom Hennon. Uh, I spent uh, I suppose I spent most of my career, certainly the beginning of my career, uh, doing um, doing software security in uh, in the defense industry. Uh, I've spent the last eight eight years at Google. The majority of that working on Google's internal software supply chain security, as well as uh, as well as Salsa, where 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 I am a maintainer. Hey folks, Ava Black, uh, been doing open source for 25 years, contributing to some infrastructure tooling, databases, big cloud stuff, uh, helped run a couple startups and companies over the years, was at Microsoft in the CTO's office working uh, with the OpenSSF and some folks there, uh, was in actually what uh, is Arno's chair now, uh, the vice chair of the TAC, uh, and then uh, made the jump to public service, now working at CISA, leading uh, the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agencies uh, work towards open source security. So. All right, well, so I don't know who wants to start. So the first question kind of is trying to set the stage is, we have been into this for over three years now as an industry. And the question really I want to ask is, are we making any progress? because we hear a lot of effort, there's a lot of churn, and we saw, I mean, I touched on some of all these efforts that are happening. And, you know, I think it's a fair question. Companies are investing a lot. And the question is, are we actually making progress? What's the status in your opinion? So I don't know who wants to be first. I'd like to hear from all of you. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll start. So I think um, one of the things, at least I'll, I'll say, coming into the open source space and, and also originally starting as an end user was um, I think a lot of folks underestimated how uh, immature a lot of organizations were generally in security. And so a lot of the things that are being developed for supply chain security um, just couldn't be adopted because of how early things are. And I think we're now recognizing um, that and both organizations are getting a little bit better where they're now starting to be able to adopt a lot of the various tools, best practices, et cetera. But also in addition to that, the general, like the broader community, um, you know, uh, various sort of tech, tech leaders are uh, seeing now that actually the tools that need to be built are maybe not, you know, we don't need the advanced stuff right the second, we do need it, but we do need to, um, actually uh, focus also on some of the folks who, who are a little bit earlier on. And uh, I'll offer a slightly contrary position. Uh, everything the old is new again, where in the early 2000s, a lot of companies grew up in the early days of open source using it as a competitive advantage. Uh, those companies understood how to be secure consumers and responsible contributors, but there were only probably 10 or 20 of those companies in the world. Um, that knowledge was not widely shared. They treated it as a competitive advantage. And now thousands of companies all over the world are depending on open source. That knowledge needs to be spread more broadly. 
Uh, and so it is new because it is not widespread, but it is old because some companies were doing this for 30 years. And that's the tension we're, we're facing. So I, um, uh, I'm going to take uh, an, an, an orthogonal view here, which is that I think we've made some great progress building out some of the infrastructure that, that, that we need here. Uh, we've, seen, um, we've seen some, some great new features in, uh, uh, in like tooling with like SBOM generation, provenance generation, building into to platforms that are widely used like, like GitHub and, and, and NPM. Um, and I think, uh, and that, that really sets us up for, for continued success going forward. Uh, whereas I think now we are, uh, we are in a point where we can start to focus on, uh, on adoption now that we have some of the, um, building blocks in place. Yeah, I'll inject a little bit of my personal opinion, if I may, as moderator. But, uh, you know, I, I can tell from an IBM point of view, I also think that we have made progress. So, you know, just a few years back when a vulnerability would come up, I mean, it would take us quite a while to figure out which product was impacted. I think we are much better off in this regard. At the same time, I do think we still have a lot of challenges ahead. So let's get a bit deeper because I don't want us to just stay too generic. So I would like you guys to tell us the kind of like one or two technologies you're particularly working on and you're interested to highlight. Whichever order. Sure. Uh, I guess hard again. Uh, so, I mean, I'm a maintainer on both Salsa and Guac um, uh, that are... Uh, um, focus on a, a lot of things in the open source uh, security space. So Salsa very much focused on um, uh, uh, build security, um, and I'll let <laughs> Tom talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but uh, Guac um, is one of the tools I, I do a lot of work with, which is focused on ingesting all the great software supply chain metadata that's out there, stuff like SBOMs, things like attestations that are often salsa attestations and, and, and so on, and then try to aggregate it with um, upstream uh, vulnerability databases like OSV um, and other sort of dependency metadata like depths.dev and, and all sorts of other things, and um, turn it into uh, something that could then be queryable so that folks can ask questions about not just an individual project supply chain, but across their entire organization, be able to ask questions like, if I have another log for shell vulnerability, does this impact one application or does it impact a hundred? Where, you know, is it impacting it because there's one version, one bad version of log for J or do we actually have multiple different versions of, uh, of, of log for J? So that's where a lot of um, my focus is and, and that helps out with stuff like uh, S2C2F conformance and, and compliance with other things as, as well. Can you tell us a bit more about the status of this project? I sure. mean, what are you guys working on? Can sure. people use it already? Yeah, yeah, no, um, folks can use it uh, today. Um, so there's a couple of different APIs that are accessible. Um, you know, it, it stores everything in a database and, and all that great stuff. Uh, so, you know, folks can ingest their SBOMs into this. They can run Guac. It's all open source, obviously. Um, they can ingest SBOMs. They can ingest Salsa. They can ingest depths.dev, OSV. Uh, most recently, we got um, uh, um, uh, a bunch of stuff around licensing as well, and um, you can run it. Uh, you can uh, there's both a GraphQL API as well as a REST API that you can use to then query about uh, your software supply chain. And a bunch of folks um, between you know Google and Microsoft and, and other folks are are uh, have been uh, using and, and contributing to the project uh, as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the question. I guess there are two um, there are two projects that are at very different stages of, of, of their development cycle that I'd like to highlight. One is uh, one is um, Sigstore, which has been around for for quite a while, and we've seen some like really excellent um, um, adoption in the community. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, SigStore really makes it very easy to, uh, for, for folks to sign the, the software artifacts that they use. Um, it can be integrated um, uh, very easily within, um, with an existing infrastructure like, uh, like, 
like GitHub Actions, and I know that we're gonna see a talk um, later this week um, about exactly how, how easy that is, and that, that does help us um, both, well, that helps us understand where, where the software and our supply chain came from. Um, we've seen that, and we've seen that integrated pretty well with, with Salsa. Um, <clears throat> on the much newer front, uh, there, is, there is currently work on the Salsa source track. Uh, so the Salsa build track, it, its goal was, was to uh, let you know how, how this binary that, that you're consuming, how it was produced, what source repo it, it, it came from, and who, and who actually built it. So the Salsa source track takes that one step further back to, um, to ask the question, well, how was that source code produced? Was it, was it managed in a safe way? Do we have... Um, do we have trust in the in the people that that contributed to it and the process that they followed? Um, that is uh, that is currently in in draft. There are some in-flight PRs, and we are focused on um, at the moment uh, um, making sure that the downstream consumers of of that source have a straightforward way of of understanding the status of that source repo and also and then at the same time thinking about um, how the various source control systems in all of their forms whether they're provided by um, by by a company that provides source as a service or or it is a distributed system um, of of, uh, of of systems pardon me, a distributed system that is um, that is maintained in like many other ways can uh, can secure their source and uh, and still reach their various uh, salsa source levels. Thank you. I will again, you know, Sorry. use my privilege. Well done. I'll, I'll get to the. Okay. Don't okay. worry. Okay. I'm not forgetting you. <laughs> You're hard to forget. Come on. <laughs> no, but so just I mean, I, with my chair of uh, maintainer of the salsa spec, I wanted to mention. You know, people who have been following Salsa may wonder what's going on because we basically released Salsa 1.0 in the spring the year before, and, and it seemed like nothing was happening anymore. And in fact, as Tom just talked about, there's been a lot of work going on in the specification group, but uh, you don't necessarily see this. We're actually working on releasing a 1.1 version, which you know, tries to address some of the, just clarification, doesn't add any significant features, then we will be working on what might be a Salsa 2.0 later on with the new features that uh, Tom was talking about. So, with this being said, thank you for your patience. Of course. <laughs> Eva. Um, so, first I'll answer your question, and then I want to come back and talk about Salsa and Sigtor for a moment. Uh, some additional tooling in this space. You mentioned uh, software dependency graphs. One of the challenges that I've, I've heard from a lot of folks in using SBOMs is having a, a very comprehensive view through an SBOM of the full transitive graph um, and being able to correlate from a CVE against an open source project to whether the project is actually affected. Uh, for example, uh, a Linux kernel compiled for a given hardware, such as in, an auto, in a car, an right? automotive Linux, um, <clears throat> or a laptop. A given build has only about 5 or 10% of the source code files incorporated in it. So a CVE affecting the project as a whole may or may not actually affect that particular build. But the SBOM format today can, but often doesn't include enough information to tell you that. Um, whereas artifact dependency graphs are emerging in a couple different uh, standards and, and, and communities as a means to more accurately and more rapidly reference is this source code <coughs> file used anywhere in this product build through uh, any number of layers of transitive dependencies. Not just is it in the top level project or one or two layers down, but is it 25 layers down? Uh, and so there's a couple projects that, that emerged in that space, one that I helped found a few years ago around the same time as some of this work. Um, that's still going on, it's called Omnibor, uh, Universal Bill of Receipts. Uh, and there's also stuff in Nix and Bazel and, and other uh, communities trying to use intrinsic identifiers rather than extrinsic identifiers to help 
identify software and better respond to vulnerabilities. So that's, I think, really exciting. Um, uh, and that's also very new, right? 20 years ago, we didn't have Git. We didn't have the idea of using a Merkle tree to track software or, or correlate to vulnerabilities. We do now. So that's emerging tech that I think can solve some of these problems that we've had for 20 years as an industry. Um, on the salsa sort of analyze the provenance or the, the risk of a project, there's, there's a project uh, up on GitHub uh, being developed by MITRE called hip check. It's in like, check it with your hip. Uh, that rather than looking at a project in its current state, <clears throat> does it currently have 2FA turned on? Does it currently have a good number of maintainers? This project tries to analyze the history of the project. Uh, so hip check looks at are the processes and the norms of the project being followed or have there been sudden fluctuations? Is there, for example, one patch with a much higher cryptographic complexity than normal for that project? Doesn't mean it's bad, but it means you should take a look at it and see if it contains something malicious. Uh, did a developer turn off two-factor authentication just for a day? Uh, did somebody commit code without it being reviewed properly? If you could have an automated way to scan all of your dependencies and then have it raise up to you these sort of concerning moments to have your teams go take a look at, um, you might have higher confidence in what you're consuming. And so that's one of the tools we're interested in to help the industry be more responsible consumers of the open source they're using. And that feeds into guidelines like S2C2F. Um, and we also published a guide uh, called uh, under the Enduring Security Framework, uh, again, around being a responsible consumer of open source software, very similar to S2C2F in its principle, a little different in its application. Um, I think that's already good stuff and good guidance, both in the camp of taking what was old and making it new. Um, there are a couple things that I do want to respond to about Sigstore and Salsa. You said Salsa's new stuff, which I, is, since I left OpenSSF, um, focus on who wrote the code, and I think that's, that's not really compatible with open source's uh, global development model. What we're interested in is very much how the code was written. Was a secure development process followed? Are there multiple stakeholders who are able to review and check each other to prevent malicious activity, minimize risk, but it is counter-interesting. It is the opposite of interesting to know the identity of the developer. And so I, I hope Salsa is not doing that because um, that would be concerning. Uh, yes, so we are, um, we are certainly not, well, pardon me. First, I will, I, will, uh, I will have to say that there are many different points of view here and that I think that um, in the Salsa source track, we, like, we would like to accommodate all of them. Um, uh, within the source track, at the moment, um, we are uh, we are often delegating the, the the question of identity to 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 the source control system itself. So how 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 they choose to um, to manage it is 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 up to them. Um, uh, we're certainly we're certainly aware that that identity itself is a um, is a hot topic uh, with with uh, with many different um, with like many different viewpoints, and we would love to get people's feedback on on what is currently proposed. It's still just it is still just draft. So um, so I so if 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 you, yes, please. And one other thing to add there is yeah so. Uh, very much that is one of the principles is we do not want to de-anonymize anybody who doesn't want to be de-anonymized. Um, but at the same time, we also, uh, Salsa is not purely just used for open source projects as well. So a lot of times it's folks who also want to understand, was this written by employees of the company? And if so, you know, is it, you know, if we have determined that, hey, a particular employee turned out to be a bad actor, we now want to kind of go back, look at their code. Um, and and uh, that sort of stuff. But yes, we, we also recognize that, in, especially in the open source space, even if you wanted to, um, somebody could create as many sock puppet accounts as they want to and be able to sort of work around that. So at least in the open source space, the focus is much more on stuff like, did they review the code? Was it reviewed? Do we at least have some reasonable 
um, do we reasonably think that this code was actually reviewed by two separate humans? That sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the problem of the identity of people on the internet obviously is a big one. I don't think we'll be able to solve anytime soon. And, you know, in IBM, for instance, we have a policy we encourage people to be transparent about who they are when they are acting on the internet, including like with their GitHub profile and so on. But I have had colleagues, female colleagues, tell me, I don't want people to know I'm a female. There are studies that actually show that a pull request from a woman is less likely to be merged than from a man. It's terrible, but that's the way it is. And when you hear that, you're like, yeah, I understand you. So there are many reasons why people may not want to reveal their identity that are actually quite valid. At the same time, you know, we saw with what happened with XE, and you know, it's, it's a case where when we're talking about the challenges, you know, don't ask us if any of the technologies we are talking about are addressing this problem. Everybody's going to look at you with a blank stare saying, uh, no, that one is really beyond our reach at this point. I don't know if eventually we'll get there. But so this is actually a good segue. The last question I wanted to raise before turning to the audience here is, you know, what are the major gaps you're seeing and what are the major challenges you're seeing? Happy to start with that one. Uh, major gap that I'm seeing again is in the software artifact dependency graphs. Uh, what I would really like to be able to do in the next couple of years is have us all drive down the complexity cost in responding to vulnerabilities. When a new one is found, whether it was an accident like log for shell or a malicious injection like XZ, either way, if there is code embedded in deep transitive dependencies, how do you figure out which products you've bought from other companies that are on your shelf, which projects you've, you've taken in that have dependencies? How do you find it? How do you find it quickly, easily, and efficiently so that your defense teams, your incident response teams, are not wasting their time? Uh, how do we reduce the noise of CVEs that don't affect a company? And right now, I think that's, that's both our biggest gap as an industry uh, the, the way that this is solved today with tools and products creates a lot of friction and a lot of opportunity, but I think more detailed, actionable, granular information will help a lot there. I'm really encouraged by some of the work, again, Nix and Basil and Omnibore, and the work around um, intrinsic identifiers in software dependency trees or graphs will help solve this but it's gonna take time to percolate. So um, I, uh, for me, the biggest gap is, is in adoption. And I think that, you know, this, this week we are gonna hear about a lot of really, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lot of really great, interesting and powerful tools. Um, but I think that we have yet to hear a compelling story about how your average open source developer who's just trying to ship their app or, 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 or their library, how are they supposed to approach this? I don't want them to become an expert in Salsa and, and SBOMs and like all of this tooling. What I would like to see is that, um, is that the best tooling to make them productive is also the most secure and that they can adopt it with, with, with no friction. And what do we need to do to make that happen? I have a quick extra comment. One thing I forgot to say, I want to see artifact dependency graphs um, present by default in a secure by default configuration across open source tools and supply chains so that specifically, so that so developers don't have to do anything extra, right? Open source tools should automatically provide the right kind of supply chain security right, okay. and transparency for developers so they don't have to go install something, they don't have to become a security expert. Totally agree. Uh, so both Tom and Ava hit the points I wanted to hit, but I think to elaborate a, a little bit there um, on one on the artifact uh, dependency graph piece is I also think that there's a little bit of work to be done, um, and that was one of the original goals of, of Guac was to actually link the two worlds of sort of the intrinsic and extrinsic, right? Because um, actually a lot of what was in Guac was inspired by things like Nix and Basil, and, and as well as now Omnibore, um, as well, uh, where, hey, we have a lot of these extrinsic things, but there's, there is more of this focus on 
let's get that more, uh, I don't want to say shift left, but extended left into the build so that we can actually see what's actually coming out of that. Um, and then in addition to that, what, to what Tom was saying a little bit about adoption, 100% agree. One of the big challenges today is if you start telling folks, there's Salsa, there's S2C2F, there's hip check, there's scorecard, there's all these different things. Um, rightfully, a lot of open source um, uh, contributors and maintainers are saying, yeah, that's not going to happen. Like, I'm not going to do all of those things. So there's a lot more of a focus on building out um, baselines, building out tool belts that can kind of tie all these pieces together where folks are thinking more about, um, you know, th the same way that you don't have to understand the intrinsics of your compiler or the, your build tool, you just run the build command. You should be able to run the build command and it should generate an artifact dependency graph. It should generate a salsa attestation and all of those things. So that's what we're seeing is now uh, ecosystems have to start adopting this as, as well. All right, thank you. Eva, we have four minutes left with okay. questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll keep it short, it's all right. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, shout out for a public funding opportunity. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's money available uh, for startups anywhere in the world, including in Europe, to work on our dependency graphs and some of this stuff. Um, so if you Google search for uh, Silicon Valley Innovation Program Artifact Dependency Graphs, uh, you should be able to find it. It's open until mid-December, um, up to 1.7 million in public funding for startups, non-dilutive. Uh, details are all on the web. I'm not going to make it more time. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. So do we have some questions? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I totally agree with the comment from Eva that it's it's mostly, uh, you know, old versus new. So I'm a Gartner analyst, and I'm also seeing that, you know, there are very few companies who are actually contributing to open source. And when you see at the demand side value, you know, we also see at the keynote that the demand side value of open source is $8.8 .8 trillion. Now, that's a very huge amount. And uh, then there is a lot of open source which doesn't come under these large foundations, you know, whether to CNCF, Linux, and all of those, and there are small packages. And we always, you know, say it out that uh, you might be using an open source library within your mission critical project that is maintained by one maintainer living in a very small district of India that you don't know about. And anything can happen to that maintainer. And now on top of that, those maintainers are burned down by a lot of work and now they will have to integrate with these security tools and all of that. And on top of that, the biggest risk, now I have to check, you know, who are the other maintainers that are joining because Etsy happened, right? So the, I, I see the biggest problem here is, you know, of maintainers. So what foundations and open source communities are thinking of, of doing in this regard, you know, to help the maintainers to, follow those security practices while not getting burned down and also uh, related to how they can get paid for what they are doing because that's another challenge because they maintain a project for a couple of years, they realize that they are broke and they went to work for some other company. So, yeah. I'll just go uh, real quick here. Yeah, so I think um, from my perspective, there's two, yeah, two, two main things uh, real quick. One is 100% uh, funding uh, for those maintainers, um, uh, uh, support for those maintainers, and, and so on, but also for the folks who are consuming open source, do they know that they're consuming open source that is just maintained by a single maintainer that maybe, you know, in certain cases, it has been end of life to, for, for several years, so. Um, big problem, agreed. Uh, I'm really encouraged to see some foundations adopting a model of uh, themselves taking ownership for the developers that work with them, building security into the foundation tooling and offering it to uh, their, their sort of members or, or sponsors. So FreeBSD uh, announced this earlier this year. They are attesting to the SSDF. This is necessary for uh, those who integrate FreeBSD into products to sell to the federal government. Um, and it's attached to funding from their members to help sustain the security of the projects in that foundation. Uh, I, I think this model could work. 
Uh, I'm hoping to hear from folks who are trying similar models in other foundations. And just, um, just like one last thing, uh, <clears throat> which is like, if we if we give developers a like platform that is easy and and secure, that that same platform could hopefully be used to to ease the burden on those maintainers. So I think we have time for one more question. We don't really, but we'll pretend we have it. Keep it short, please. I will. That was a great launching off point for my question. Um, from your answer to the last uh, question from Arnaud, it seems like the best intervention point for more secure open source software is not the maintainer, not the consumer, but the platform where uh, open source repositories are housed. I haven't heard this come up in a lot of security conversations before. Can you talk more about what it will take to increase adoption among those platforms? So um, I think one of the problems that I've seen is that a, a clear actionable vision has yet to be articulated and, and, uh, and internalized um, amongst these, these ecosystems. We have seen some success here with, uh, with the uh, SIG store and Providence adoption work in, in, in NPM as being a, uh, as being a inflection point where now that other ecosystems have seen it done, they, they are interested in saying, oh, let's do something like, like that. We have yet to see an, an example, <clears throat> excuse me, an example well-lit path workflow that plugs in, that is pluggable and enables, and enables these, these, these tools to just be dropped in where, where needed. I think before we see this adopted in an ecosystem wholesale, we will need to provide an example proof of concept that, um, that shows what is actually possible um, and that that can be used to, um, to drive uh, bi um, built-in adoption where we need it. I think that's important. And also I think for that to be widely adopted, we cannot simply rely on the goodwill of volunteers. Companies need to put away their uh, notions of profit-motivated insecurity that have been driving a lot of behavioral patterns in open source for the past 10, 15 years. What we used to call freeware or shareware, uh, I, I've seen so many companies over the past 15 years give away something and withhold security essential features. CISA launched a Secure by Design pledge last year. Well, in open source, a lot of companies sell a product that has logging, it has two-factor auth, it has better security features built on top of the same open source they gave away for free that can't be easily secured. That needs to stop. We need companies to actually become responsible consumers and sustainable contributors to make that open source secure. All right, on this, I'm sorry. I know there may be other questions. I think we'll all be around for the next several days, so feel free to reach out outside. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for my colleague panelists for participating in this. <laughs>